Sounds good. Well, John, thanks for taking the time to uh, chat with me today and chat with us today um, with COVID. And I also will apologize in case my uh, dog chooses to interrupt, and I imagine he will. So, yeah, um, everybody knows about Q and Stargate, and uh, but nobody, I've nobody ever seems to uh, get to hear too much about you as a sailor and uh, that's something that I've been really curious about and I know you and I talked a little bit on the phone before but um, one of the things that I really wanted was really curious about is how did you get into it because obviously you know it's a sports show and we're doing these kind of live cast to augment it but uh, I wanted to just ask you about that and, and how you got into it. Well, I mean, I got into it. I went to summer camp. I was 10 years old, and uh, it was on Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire, which is a big lake. It's got about, it's, I think it's 26 miles long. And um, the camp had um, a couple of sailboats, and they had those little sunfish. So I started sailing with that. And, um, and then my father, who uh, worked most of the time, I mean, he was a musician, uh, a professional, and he was gone most of the time. Um, he enjoyed sailing, so he and I would sail uh, either on Lake Winnipesaukee or uh, then he bought a sailboat. And, um, and that became sort of an adventure that he and I could, could share. Um, and I just continued doing that. I mean, it's um, I've now sailed, uh, you know, a, a great deal more than he ever sailed. Um, so I just I just took it on, and I've always had sailboats. Uh, I had a sailboat when I was a kid. Um, uh, that was his sailboat, and I used to go off uh, into Chesapeake in, in the Chesapeake Bay and sail for sometimes as much as a week at a time alone. Oh, wow. And uh, and then um, when I came out to the east or to the west coast, I, I bought a sailboat, and then I bought another sailboat, and then uh, and then now I'm on yet another sailboat. So, uh, and uh, my big expedition, as it were, of something I had dreamed of doing, was to sail from uh, from wherever I was, in this case it was California, uh, to the South Seas, and uh, I was able to do that about I don't know seven years ago. Wow, and and how long did that? How long was that punt? Well, I broke it up into two um, into two events. So it was sailing downhill, as it's called, um, the milk run, as some you know some people call it. To uh, first of all, to the Marqueses, which I think took about twenty four days. And then uh, on to the Tuamotos, which was two or three days, or a couple, I don't even remember anymore. Mm -hmm. And then from Tuamotos on to the um, on to the Society Islands, which includes Tahiti and Morea and Rayatea. And then I put the boat up, and uh, and I flew home. And about six months, eight months later, I came back down, and took the boat back up. To uh, via Hawaii all the way back up to um, back up to uh, Ventura and that was a 52 days at sea. Wow. How do you prepare for something like that? Like how do you, well I guess we should probably go from the very beginning. Um, so let's say somebody's never been in a sailboat. What's the first type of experience that they're going to have? What's the first thing that they're going to learn when they're in a, a smaller boat? Uh, with their dad, what what are some of the things they need to learn to do to kind of get command of? Well, they should start in a small boat, um, and um, I, I that's how I started. I made a mistake with my own kids who are not particularly interested, uh, and, I, and that was my the mistake that I made is that I handed a big boat to them and expected them to pick it up as quickly as I did. And, and it was scary and intimidating. And you were out in the ocean and, uh, you know, traveling at night. And it was like, oh, my God. And um, 
So if they were to do this, uh, let's say it's a, you know, a parent who wants their kid to sail, is, um, is really to start out off on little boats, you know, little eight-footers that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a non-blustery day where um, it's just not scary, that's all. And, and, you know, to get a little bit of a lesson and to, and to take it, you know, to take it like that. That's, that's probably the best way of doing something like this. So if you're in a small boat, say an eight footer, and I'm chuckling a little bit because my dad thought it would be a good idea to put me in a catamaran. Uh, so I have a little bit of experience with the kind of thing with your kids. My dad did the same thing to me, uh, and I, I never really probably got into it as much as I should have, although I've always been interested in it. Um, let's say if you're bringing somebody or the first time in a boat, what are the fundamentals that they're going to learn or that they should learn? What's the first thing they need to do? What are the well, the first thing that I ask them, and, and this is me sailing with them in on the Pacific, mm -hmm. is the first thing I ask them is, do you get seasick? Mm -hmm. um, that makes all the difference in the world for, uh, for neophytes. I mean, if they spend whatever it is, you know, eight hours yep. being sick, um, that's, not an ex that's not an experience that, uh, that they want to have. No. Um, so, you know, I've, I've, had to, I've taken people out and I've had to say to them, um, you know, well, I've said to them, I'm, you know, I'm going to ask you to take seasick pills. I'm not turning back, you know, blah, blah, blah. But right. I'll... I'll Ultimately, I will turn back, and it's a drag because you 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 have stocked the boat for two or three days, and um, you know after about three or four hours, and they're just miserable. Um, uh, you just turn back, and, and you, so you try to avoid that. Um, you know, giving if, if there's not a seasickness issue, and you're not going out into um, into difficult weather. Um, most people kind of are interested. They're, they're interested. Why is it that the boat is is moving forward um, uh, just on the uh, on the energy of the wind? And and so you explain all of that. Um, uh, so that you know that's that's sort of what that's that's what I do. Although I'm not in the process usually of giving a lesson, um, but. Um, you know, I, I, I have a few friends who enjoy sailing. And what's really nice about that is that there's nothing worse on a sailboat or any boat is somebody who's just an eating machine and a drinking machine and a completely oblivious to what's going on sailing. Not, yeah, exactly. You wouldn't want that. I mean, you just kind of go, oh, my God, I'm just the bus driver for this person. Yeah, exactly. So, so that, that's not fun. No. No, it wouldn't be. So assuming that somebody is interested and they do want to learn and they don't get seasick and this is something that they really want to set out uh, and they want to give it a try, so they get in the boat or even before they get in the boat, it, um, for example, if it were you, what do you do to prepare in the boat? Is there anything that you do to set up the boat? Do you have to tie anything down? Is there, I'm probably asking stupid questions, but basically if you were giving a lesson or something that you wish that somebody would have told you when you did, if, if you were to kind of break it down a little bit, what would you, what would you have someone do or what would you have done in a smaller boat well, in the first punt? Uh I mean, a lot of this, it really depends on how old they are and where you're sailing and what sort of boat you're sailing. Mm -hmm. you know, if, you're, if you're sailing a little sunfish, clearly, which is essentially kind of a surfboard with a sail on it, yeah. or let's say, um, you know, a little eight foot uh, fatty knees or something like that, mm -hmm. then you're, you're really saying, look, you must wear a life preserver. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are not going to go out. Uh, we're going to also lake sailing is very different than ocean sailing. Uh, I sail in the ocean where it's for the most part, I have um, um, 
uh, you know, winds that are coming from, you know, a general direction. I mean, I, I, I know that for the most part, the winds are going to be coming from the northwest. So, you know, I have a, a set winds and things like that. It, it just, it just, it really depends. I mean, the biggest thing is safety. The biggest thing is to have, for it not to be a, an ordeal. Um, uh, and I see, I, I um, when I take my boat out, I, I often pass, you know, little kids who are, who are sailing, you know, little boats and they are, they're beginning to understand how you move, how the boat moves. And that's, that's truly the best way to learn. Um, uh, just throwing uh, somebody into, um, into a big boat and expecting them to be able to handle it. I mean, I, you know, I have a boat that if you do not think, if you're not thinking, you can take off a finger or you can get bashed or you can, you know, bad things can happen. Mm -hmm. You have to always thinking um so um so I, I just think it's important as uh, in to start with you don't give uh you know i had i had a really uh, an interesting experience i'm not i don't know that about cars but you know a kid growing up in los angeles invariably they're going to need a car yeah I, I i wasn't given a car when i was a kid but I didn't grow up in Los Angeles. I grew up in Philadelphia, and that was the way it was. Yeah. And so I, I, I came out of a, a meeting, and across the street, there was a used car lot there. And I went across the street, and I said, you know, my son is turning, well, I forget what he was, 16, 17 years old. I'd like to get him a car. I see this car here is, um, is sort of in the price range of what I'm willing to pay. Mm -hmm. And the guy was really terrific. He said, you know, that is a BMW M, M something, M3 or something like that. That is a nice said, car. I won't sell it to you. Uh, I said, what? He said, this is not a car for a teenager. This is an extremely fast car, yeah. and they're going to get in trouble. Well, it's, and, and, I, and in the end, I, I got him a yellow Volvo, an old Volvo, which he hated. But in any case... Um, I, I say the same thing with sailing. You know, it, it, there's no point to give somebody who really doesn't know some s fancy, really fast, what have you. And, you know, a nice little, a, a little dinghy with a sail and what have you. And and you're in the harbor, which is which is which is, or on a lake, which is less dangerous. And you learn. That's how. So this is a long-winded answer as to where you should start. So let's say uh, you start on the lake. What are the kinds of things that you would learn on a lake? Uh, so your first lesson, number one, you're on the lake with somebody. What are you, I mean, obviously safety. What, what kinds of stuff are you trying to get them to pay attention and get a feel for? What kinds of things are they going to want to learn that will eventually they'll start to transition, which we can go into in a little bit. Well, I mean, what you're talking about is where's the wind coming from and where do you want to go? <laughs> Pretty simple. Yeah. yeah. If you want to go exactly, um, if you want, you want to go from where the wind is coming from. In other words, uh, you know, you want to go to that island over there, which is, let's say, a quarter of a mile away, but the wind is coming directly from that island. Yep. You are not going to be able to point directly to that island. You're going to have to tack back and forth and back and forth. If you want to go to that island and the wind is coming from behind you, you just let the sail out and it'll take you there. And um, and and you you sort of explain what it is about sailing. It, it's 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 like the wing of a bird or the wing of an airplane. Uh, we know that on the wing of an airplane, the reason that it's the vacuum as the as the wind rushes over it and under it and what have you, it's the vacuum that begins to lift that airplane up. Well, it's very much the same way on on a on a um, on a on a sailboat and. Uh, you know, that sail, that mass is pointed up, but that mass could be pointed sideways and it's a wing. Well, if it's pointed up, it's still a wing. And if you have a keel boat, 
you, the other part of that wing is in a keel that's underneath the boat. So it's, that's helping you with your directionality. And, um, and certain sails uh, are more having to do with stabilizing and, uh, and other sails have more to do with, uh, with, uh, with actual thrust or, or pull. What are some of the things that you see uh, with newer individuals that are learning and they don't really understand the concept of how to tack? What are some of the things that, that you see commonly that, that kind of indicate that they're still trying to wrap their head around it or, or they don't really understand that they're still trying to figure it out? What are some things that, Most that you see people, commonly? One of the things in which you have to learn is how to trim your sails uh, so as that you get the most out of them. Uh, the boat in which I took to the South Pacific and back was a catch. And I would just marvel at the fact that the last sail on a catch, uh, uh, it, it, well, it, it is, the, is the mizzen sail. Uh, sometimes all I would have to do is, is, is release the mizzen boom by just a few inches and I would gain a half a knot uh, because there there is turbulence between those sails, and the more you get you you the more you allow that wind to slip through, the more um, the more speed you'll get. I mean, this is you're, the questions that you're asking me are are, are uh, uh, no worries. Uh, the questions that you are asking me are very general questions True. that I can only really answer generally. And I can't really give you just verbally a sailing lesson. Fair enough. Uh, you know, so it's, um, you know, it's a little bit like asking me, how do you drive in snow? Well, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, it's not fun. That I can tell you. It's, right. It's not a whole lot of fun. No, no, that makes sense. And that's the thing that, that sucks with COVID. I mean, all we can really do is describe, but uh, hopefully once COVID's done, we can get out of the water and, and show it. But, um, but given that we're within the confines of, of speech, uh, what are some things that, um, you know, because we can't really go into it in, in too much detail, um, what are some things that, that you would like people to know? Like if somebody that just, as I say, doesn't know anything about it, and again, within the confines of what we're working within, with just speech, uh, what are some things you wish people would know or would like them to take away from it that they, if they wanted to try it? Well, I mean, if it's just in the confines of speech and sitting at home, uh, I mean, the best thing is to go sailing. Go and rent yourself a little sailboat and go out in the lake and, and poop around. That's the best thing. Uh, there are, uh, in fact, sailing um, um, apps, uh, um, kind of like, you know, I don't know what you call them, video games sort of type of things where where you are sailing you know, between a course and, you know, you're, you're doing all of that. One of the things in which I That's did. That's so cool. They have yeah. sailing simulators, like flight sims? Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. One of the things in which I did, but I started very early on, and that is, is that I found myself reading an enormous amount uh, on the subject. Mm -hmm. uh, any mm -hmm. book that was written about... Um, and I don't mean a novel. I was never interested in novels. Mm -hmm. I was always interested in, in you know, the person, uh, you know, when you know Chichester, and he went around the world. And how did you? How do you sleep? Uh, when do you sleep if you're the only one on the boat? And who's steering? And uh, and uh, what do you do if you get into a storm? And uh, and what if you're going too fast and you begin pitch poling and uh, you know, the, the thousands of, of, of scenarios that you begin logging into your head. And then when you actually go sailing, you begin going, oh, ho, ho, well, I'm, um, you know, it's, I'm doing 
whatever. I'm uh, the, the wind is you know 12 knots now, but it's beginning to to pick up. Uh, it gives minutes. you context and a point of reference, so that at least you have a, a little bit of a an information background of what other individuals that have run into it to do. So at least you're not going completely from scratch. Exactly. And so so as I was saying, you know. The, the wind is beginning to pick up and, you know, you will have learned, if you haven't learned it yourself, then you will have read about it. And hopefully you'll be one of these people who can learn from other people's mistakes. Uh, you will have heard said over and over and over again, don't let, don't let situations overtake you. So if you're beginning, if you're beginning to see that the that the wind is beginning to uh, to uh, just get, you know, it's it's getting windier, um, and then you start reefing before you need to reef, rather than having to wait, where it's uh, it's it, it could become dangerous and 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 you could become overpowered, over canvassed, and um, so you you you. One of the things in which I like about sailing is that you are always running, you are out of your head and you are always running scenarios, always running scenarios. What if that line broke over there? What would I do? What, what would, it's a little bit like, and I didn't, I never played baseball, but I, I've heard people talk about this. One of the things in which you train at is that wherever you are, um, what would you do if, you know, if somebody was running, whatever, from first to second and uh, the guy was going, you know, you know there, what, what, there, there are certain combinations and you got the ball, where would you throw it? What would, you know, so you think of these things ahead of time. So they become sort of automatic. I, I've had, Makes sense. I've had, I've had a case where um, many times I go through a channel and uh, I used to go through the channel without a, a sail on. Mm -hmm. Well, I learned the hard way and that is, is that what would happen if your engine went out? Well, my engine once did go out mm -hmm. and I was in a channel. So I did not have time to raise a sail. So I needed to, to run forward, run forward um, drop an anchor, make sure I drop maybe about 40 feet so that it would catch on its own, rush back down into the engine room because now I'm going, I'm thinking that's because I have to bleed the, the engine, bleed the engine, rush back up. You know, in other words, I, but I, I didn't have, I, 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 I needed to be ahead of the game, ahead of the ball not going, oh my gosh, what would I do? But I have gone through those scenarios enough in my head that I, that I can go to, you know, plan A, B, C, D, E, like that, bum, 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 bum. And, and that's one of the things in which I happen to like about sailing. I gotta tell you, John, um, I mean, obviously I'm not a sailor myself, but it reminds me a lot of flying. I actually am a private pilot and, um, it really reminds me a lot of, because you are pre-planning all the time. You do have to have your charts and everything ahead of time, and you're constantly listening to the squawk, and you have all this information that you're constantly processing, uh, especially if you're flying VFR, uh, more so to some degree IFR, night flying. I mean, I don't know if, I, I'm sure it's not the same, but it is interesting hearing you talk about this because it really does remind me a lot of the kind of constant, not problem solving, but anticipating the scenarios so that when something does change quickly, that you're able to adapt to it. Exactly, exactly. And the difference is, is that for you, these things happen faster than they do for me. Mm. Uh, most instances, um, I can see things coming. I have enough time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, so I, and I'm always checking. I'm always checking. Mm -hmm. 
with flying you don't. I mean, you have some information. I mean, you'll have your weather information and you'll have your gauges that show you pressure and that sort of thing. But even if you know that there are going to be certain conditions, you can still have a sudden drop in barometric pressure that can affect your visibility, that can possibly blow you off course, that can, there are a number of things. You can still correct, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you, things do happen fast. You have an idea of what's coming. You typically are, depending on the weather conditions that you're working within, you're generally working within 85 to 95 percent accuracy unless you're not really being careful, in which case you probably shouldn't be a pilot. Um, but yeah, I mean, you get the information and then you generally have very little time to react. Yeah, well, um, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, you know, that's why uh, for long trips you have ditch bags so that you have already decided what is the essential stuff that needs to 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 to, uh, uh, to get thrown into that life raft? Uh, yeah. You you have uh, um, you already have decided what it is that you are going to say. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, it's written down, so it's just the information that needs to be put out there. Yep. Uh, the you know the e perv uh, is ready to go. The the life raft is ready. I mean, there are lots of things that you organize yourself uh, so that and you and you just go through it. You just go, th you know, you 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 just go through it. Also, one of the things in which I have found I've gone from a simple boat to a much more complicated boat, which mm -hmm. I, I enjoy some of the, the elements of the of the new boat. But I have to say, I I've always I, I I still feel more secure uh, in the older boat I mean um, because it comes under the the heading I don't know if this is the case with this with flying but you know there's that kiss thing keep it simple stupid yeah it's, and it's very similar very similar. right yeah. so you know uh, like right now uh, I'm I'm looking at uh, uh, splitting a battery bank and uh the guy i'm who's helping me he said uh, you know we can get an electronic splitter and i went no 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 mechanical mechanical yeah because if something goes wrong you can troubleshoot it and fix it yeah all i have to do is go this you know boom boom like that yeah, I don't because want... there's something physical that you can take and, right. and troubleshoot and figure out where it is that you need to right yeah. You know, it's uh, I have now in what's called in mass furling. Well, it certainly makes um, it makes uh, um, reefing w uh, uh, a lot simpler and and frankly safer. But God help you if that if if the uh, if the sail somehow got stuck in the mass. Yep. Uh, as opposed to reef sailing reef. Uh, um, slab reefing which i had on the hans christian all you do is you just go up there and you yank on that sail and it just comes down end of the story um so there there are trade-offs mm -hmm. it really is analogous because um for example like everybody learns to fly in a single engine now a single engine is almost always invariably uh fully mechanical. You don't generally have computer-aided, um, there's no computer-assisted anything. Everything is connected to a pulley, uh, regardless of uh, your yoke, uh, your pedals, so pitch, yaw, it's all controlled by you and you can physically feel it. Uh, I mean, obviously you do have instruments, but your instruments, again, are generally electronic and you can very much feel what is going on in that aircraft. And in some ways, it's more physical. Now, once you go from your single engine and start going into larger planes, like your, your twin engines and, and turboprops, um, you get more power and you learn the, the boats are, or, sorry, not the boats. Well, they're kind of like boats, I guess. Uh, like, for example, a twin engine, um, they're a lot 
they're a lot bigger, so they can take a little bit more punishment. So they're not going to throw around as much in the air. However, if one of the engine gives out, um, for example, if I'm in a Cessna 172 or a 150, if my engine gives out and I can find a clearing, it's basically just a glider. So I can usually find a place that I can, I might get banged up a little bit, but I can land. And I have had an engine give out on me. It's not fun. It's one of the things they teach you when you fly. A, sing, uh, or a twin engine, it's a little harder because you need both of them for balance, but you still can. Once you start getting into your turboprops, then you're dealing with a lot more power. Once you get into a jet, forget it. The computer, you have so much speed and you have so much power, the computer does need to assist and there are a number of redundancies. So a lot of those trade-offs, again, I'm not a sailor, um, but it, it's interesting hearing you talk about those things because it, it really does seem like there's a lot of, no pun intended, analogs to it. You know, you've been breaking off. up for the last 10 seconds or so. Oh, geez. Sorry about that. Is it still breaking up? Uh, well, you have to talk. All right. Um, testing yeah, one, two, three. That, uh, seemed, still, still... that seems okay. Okay. All right. My apologies for the, the connection. Yeah, all I was saying was that um, it, it's, it's interesting hearing you talk about this stuff because it is, there do seem to be a lot of, an, uh, a lot of analogs to different uh, classes of aircraft. Like, um, you have the similar sort of trade-offs. With the smaller aircraft, you have uh, everything is mechanical so you have full control over everything and if an engine gives out you can just land because it's basically a glider but by the same token the larger the aircraft the more computer assisted control because you have a lot more thrust and things that require redundancies so you trade stuff off as well yeah and also i would imagine the smaller the aircraft the much more the um you know, it's a little bit like a motorcycle yes. or or a little boat, you know, a little a little, um, you know, a little um, runabout. You you are really close to the water and you are very much at the affect of the wind. Correct. Uh, and so you you just begin to understand you under you, you just begin to understand those forces um, in uh in a much more minute sort of way and in and, and a way which you can build on as you begin to um, appreciate, you know, going uh, into larger boats and, and uh, you know, bigger seas and, and on and on and on. Because the bigger it is, the more, uh, the more you can push around the elements somewhat, but you're never going to be able to be stronger than the elements themselves. So, and, and you're absolutely right. When you're in a small aircraft, you are absolutely at the mercy of the wind and it can push you around at will. So that isn't to say that charts don't become less important uh, and your weather conditions and everything that you check uh, become less important with larger aircraft, but you can push through and kind of muscle your way through with larger aircraft in a way that you can't with a smaller one. So the smaller one really teaches you uh, to respect uh, and work within those conditions. Because there's only six inches between you and the windshield. Like if I'm in a little 150, a little Cessna 150, like there's only like six inches between me and the windshield and I can feel the aircraft rocking around. I imagine yeah. there's a similarity with the, the smaller boat, but when you get to something bigger, you know kind of how to work within that and then you kind of know how to deal with that power because you have a respect for what you're up against. Absolutely. When you were learning, were there some things that kind of stood out, shall we say, that kind of really kind of made you remember? I, I know when I was learning to fly there, I had a few oh my God, and I learned real good and I, I didn't do it again. <laughs> There's some things that stand out while you were learning in the, the many stories. Oh, 
yeah, uh, they don't stand out, I'm afraid, anymore. Uh, they've just been folded into the way in which I handle most everything. That's fair. You know, um, uh, um, so um, I, uh, uh, you know, there are certain things that you learn along the way that, um, that, uh, uh, are really tried and true. Uh, any sailor who uh, who is going by a, a calendar or a schedule um, is more vulnerable, and, and I'm sure that this goes with uh, with flying. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. You, you, yeah. You you just you just you just don't do those things. You know, it, it requires a certain amount of discipline and it requires uh, judgment. Uh, I, I, you know what? I'm uh, monitoring, as we're supposed to, 16 all the time on the VHF. And you are hearing uh, um, conversations between uh, Coast Guard and people out at sea that you just kind of go, uh, they should not be out at sea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for for what you do to get out in a plane, you, you really have to, you, you cannot get your license, as it were. But there is no license for going out on the water. And I, I I can't tell you how often I have heard, you know, a little runabout with 12 people in it, who, uh, where as far as I'm concerned, more than four or five would, would have been crowded yep. uh, 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 out, uh, out uh, you, know, you know, halfway between uh, the, the mainland and the Channel Islands. and in trouble, in trouble, and not, and then when being asked, where are you, not being able to say, uh, I, I, they just didn't know, they don't, I, I don't know. So they're having to run, you know, count backwards, you know, count up to 10 and then backwards back to 10 so that they can get some sort of radio, or, or, or radio uh, triangulation on them because, uh, uh, they, you know, they don't have uh, they don't have any GPS equipment. They they don't know how to fix their engine. It doesn't they, surprise me. It doesn't just surprise me at all. And, and people uh, people die every year in this in this area uh, all the time, actually. Um, uh, so um, you you uh, it, I, I, I sometimes my. Um, friends or something would say, uh, oh, oh, you don't have to go up early and get the boat ready. You know, I know it's a big job. Uh, we, you know, no, we're the same with flying. It's we're exactly just going, same. we're just going to go out. You know, all I want to do is just do a day sail. And you kind of go, you know, it doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't work that way. That, um, you can be only four or five miles off the coast and something bad can happen. Yep. And if you think you're going to swim five miles in this in these waters back to the back to the, the you know the mainland you're crazy it's the same crap with flying because you you always have i mean yes you have to have your pilot's license and you know you can hear on the radio if you're on the same frequency but even even in private private flying even somebody that has their full license or at least their student permit you know, there's always some moron that will go, ah, you know what, I don't really need to check the weather conditions. I, 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 I can handle it. Well, no, you can't handle it yet because you don't have more than 70 or 80 hours or whatever. And then invariably they find themselves blown off course because they've overestimated their ability and experience level in those conditions. And a lot of the time um, when there are issues and accidents with smaller aircrafts and, and, and even larger ones. Uh, with the FAA, they're usually from people that are not flying to conditions. I always call it budget to conditions. You know, you are at the end of the day a little thing in the grand scheme of things and a big wide something. In my case, it's the air. Yeah, there's not necessarily going to be something that I'm going to crash into per se. Um, and, you know, it's the same for you. You have water and 
it's a big wide something that you have to navigate and it's a lot bigger than you and there's a lot of things that you have to be able to be mindful of and deal with it safely. Yeah, and most people don't realize, and, it, and I can understand that they don't. They think that, That's fair. that if something happens, it is because of a dramatic failure or a dramatic oversight or something like that. And in most instances, it is a series of little things. Confluence of smaller factors that pile up. That pile up, you know? You just weren't, you, you just weren't thinking, you just weren't, uh, you, you weren't aware, you, um, you, you know, little, little stuff, little stuff, you know, you, I mean, I'm just thinking of, 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 I'm making one up now, but a line, you know, let's say you are, for some crazy reason, you are now beached on the, uh, you know, you, you, you didn't make it through the, the inlet and you're beached, uh, which is, a, which is essentially like, oh, perhaps totaling the boat. Mm -hmm. Well, well, you could say, well, it's because I lost my engine. Well, actually, you didn't lose your engine. You wrapped the line around the prop. And well, well, well how is that possible? Well, it's because when you took that mooring line off, you did not stow the mooring line. You left it uh, you know, on the stern. And after a while, you didn't pay attention and what have you, and it fell in the water, and it was still attached. And it went, it got into the propeller just at the wrong time, and it, it bound your propeller just when you were going through the straits, and you lost your engine. And because you didn't have one sail up, which you should have, just in case you lose your engine, you lost control of the, uh, of the boat and it went on. So it's a little thing. It's little. These are little things. Big dramatic, uh, big dramatic, uh, um, you know, collision maybe. But it was a little. It was all just because that. I, I have an. Ins I have a story where. I climbed to the, I was getting my boat ready to go. And um, uh, there is a, a plate at the very top of the mast that had six screws, or excuse me, eight screws uh, screwing down the plate onto the top of the mast. And it was a plate that was, uh, that had a ring on it uh, for holding the spinnaker. And so, I had reseated everything, just making sure everything was right. And I got to the last screw, the eighth screw, and I'm screwing it back down, and it's stripped. Oh. And I went, oh, shit. So I went, oh, come on, there are eight. So now there are only seven, you know, big deal. That plagued me. Yeah, because... Being up, uh, you know, a hundred and or, or being up fifty-eight feet up in the air uh, on a bosun's chair is not a comfortable experience. And um, I realized I came back down, and the day was finished. And um, I thought about it that night, and I went, "I have to go back up tomorrow. I have to go back up. This will plague me." If I ever get into some bad situation and there's a lot of pressure up there, uh, I'm going to be thinking about that. And I have to go up. I went back up. I pulled out all seven screws. I then retapped that f that fourth, that, that eighth screw. I had to retap it, re do a new tap onto the thing, find a larger um, uh, um, uh, a bolt to put in, a screw to put in. I mean, it, it took me a whole other day. Oh. But it's all about uh, making sure that things are as good as you can possibly make them. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And there's always something. There, you know, there's always something. But you want to try and as much as you can. As I say, not that I keep going back to flying, but you know, do your circle check, whatever. There's always going to be something that can happen. But exactly. at, at least 
if you've got the major stuff, you do your circle check. You make sure that you're flying to conditions. You ha or, you know, and the same with your case, you know, uh, and that, you know, you've got your charts and you are communicating properly to, with the tower and you're doing everything you're supposed to do. Then, if you'll pardon my vulgarity, it's just a little shit and then it's a little easier to deal with because it's more of an annoyance and you can catch it because you're not necessarily trying to deal with you know 28 things at the same time you might only be dealing with one or two so that you can deal with them before they become a catastrophe because you've right. got the rest of it going and then you just file it away with the okay well I never want to deal with that crap again and then keep going I had an experience. I just sold uh, the the, um, the Hans Christian, and um, we were. Uh, it had been pulled out so that they could check the bottom, and you know mm -hmm. they were doing the survey and what have you. And I was bringing, uh, and the survey went well. Everything was fine and what have you. And I'm bringing the boat back into the slip, and the potential owners, new owners, are on the boat. And I just by, I'm not one of these people who hot rods around. I don't go faster than I need to go. Mostly because I, I've learned that the faster you go, if something happens, the more damage is created. I have never, ever had an accident with any of the boats that I've had. Um, so I am going into a slip. Now the wind is at my back. It's a new slip and the wind is at my back. So I have slowed the boat down to, I don't know, you know, a couple of knots per hour. It, it's, it's a, but it's also a 30 ton boat. Uh, I am now about uh, a, a boat length and a half away and I slip it from a very, very modest forward to into neutral and then into reverse. I lost reverse. I am also too close to the to the docks to be able to abort. Um, and that boat, uh, I went, oh my God. I, uh, there's no, I have no decision that I can make other than to slow, to bring the boat in, slide it along the side of the boat to, by friction, slow it down, and then just plow into the slip. Uh, I, 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 it was all based on one thing, the throttle mechanism has a cable that mm -hmm. goes that goes all the way down and 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 you know moves the lever on the transmission there is a little u-shaped uh, um, uh, clip that holds that throttle mechanism in place that had come out a a 25 cent clip that had never come out in the 25 years that I owned the boat. Oh. And uh, 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 luckily the people were boat owners. They, they understood what the problem is. I immediately said, I will pay for this because the, um, the, uh, the Bob stay got, um, got bent uh, and blah, blah, blah. But it, that mistake was a, uh, I, I, I don't want to minimize, you know, PTSD, because when you hear about it, usually it's from, you know, people who've had horrific experiences. But it was so, the lack of control and the fact that I was just moving forward and I was just going to crash my boat, I pl replayed that for the following week i must have played it replayed it in my mind i can understand that i can understand that. Times. um 
it was so stressful. And it, it was just on something that you kind of go, well, I, I don't know. I mean, that, who would have thought? And so, yes, there will be things that happen. Yep. Yeah, and it just goes just goes to show the importance of making sure and you can be the most you can be the most organized person in the world and do everything right. We're still human. Every so often we might miss something and again it just underlines the importance of going over the little things. Absolutely. That's that's really all there is to it. So, what are you doing now? Uh, these days, John, with uh, are you going out on any more uh, punts? Anything you're excited about? Uh, any trips you're excited about? Uh, about sailing, you mean, or yeah. or just well, in anything in general. I'm not. I don't want to box you in a corner, but well, uh, I mean, I'm go. I, I'm starting up uh, um, uh, shooting uh, Star Trek here. Uh, we we started uh, about a month ago, and then had to shut down because of a COVID, a COVID situation and what have you. But I'm starting that back up next week. And um, that's, you know, the main thing, frankly. And then, um, and then in the boating world, uh, I, am, uh, I am struggling. I'm learning more about batteries than I've ever learned before and uh, I'm dealing with um, with, uh, with with reconditioning a, a very large bank of batteries <laughs> oh my goodness yeah well COVID's kind of tough on everybody um, at least we're starting to get the vaccines out so hopefully by the fall I know it's impacted our shooting schedule we've managed to get stuff done but because of the way that, I think I sent you some screeners, the way that we deliver the show to the ABC and Fox and CBS stations, it's pretty easy to social distance. But we still have episodes where we've got people wearing a mask and, and uh, it's really, really all you can do. Um, and it's funny because- Where are uh, you located in Canada? <laughs> if you can believe it, uh, we are located in Melville, Saskatchewan. So, oh, you're in Saskatchewan. In Saskatchewan, oh. so just just uh, just a couple of hours away from the uh, from from the Montana border, or not the Montana border, the uh, the Minnesota border. Uh huh. So, right. And then uh, I spent most of my life. Um, I wasn't born here. I was born closer to uh, to Ogdensburg, New York. So I spent. Uh, you can't see it because for some reason the video, you can't see my video, but uh, I'm wearing my Syracuse orange hoodie. So I grew up sort of cheering for the orange. So I had done my punt and then I worked for the networks up here on the border and then back and forth. So uh, it's, it's a little bit different up here. It's, uh, now you cannot, um, uh, I have one son who lives in Quebec City. Yeah. And uh, I lived in Montreal uh, for a, a good long time. Actually, uh, yeah. I'm I was born in Ottawa, uh, and then uh, we moved to the country when I was a. That's why my uh, and my brother's four years younger than me, so I actually speak French fluently, but my brother doesn't. <laughs> oh, cool. Um, <laughs> How does he like I, it? Uh, Sorry, I didn't uh, mean to interrupt. This, this is kind of funny. And Quebec City. So beautiful. you you can't get. You, I guess you cannot come into the States right now either. I mean, I can't go into Canada right now. They, they keep changing it all the time. Um, they, they had it unilaterally for a while where you could go in the United States, but they weren't letting Americans come into Canada. And then it swapped a little bit and it kept changing. Just to be on the safe side, the shooting You know, you're I, breaking up again. Oh. Does this, uh, is this a little bit better, John? No. No, it's still breaking up. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. Is it still breaking up? Or is it yes. improving? Oh, jeez. I, uh, I apologize for the, uh, the, I'm not sure yeah, what's going on. Yeah, you are really. breaking up a lot, actually. Oh, jeez. Uh, well, hopefully it'll improve. I'm going to try, good thing we're not doing this live. Does this improve things at all, John, or no? You are breaking up. 
Okay. Uh, but you know what, Corey? The, my, um, I also looked at the time here, and yeah, I, we've gone on a little while. Yeah. So, can we, we wrap it up? Yeah, we can wrap it up. We can wrap it up, and it's taped, so we can always uh, all chop the the last bit in later. Right. Nice chatting with you. Yeah, likewise. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I know the audio is breaking up. I'll text you after, but uh, once things open back up, uh, hopefully we can get you for an episode the next time I'm in uh, Los Angeles once they open up the borders and you can show us on the show for real. Sounds good. Sounds All right. Good. Thanks so much, John. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye. All right, well, that was John Delancey taking the time to tell us about his background with sailing and uh, hope, unfortunately, obviously, because of COVID, we can't show it, but uh, the plan is to do an episode once COVID and everything winds up. And if you want a little bit more information for what John is doing, make sure you visit johndelancey.com. And of course, as always, please make sure that you hit that subscribe button. Uh, we are going to aim to do a number of these different things uh, with different interviews with people doing interesting things uh, just while we kind of get through COVID. And of course, make sure that you watch Go Nitro on ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC, and CW stations near you. And you can go to GoNitro.tv for, uh, for details.